sure I got this microphone on correctly. It was dangling from me during the Bible class period. I don't want John to beat me up afterwards. It is certainly good to be with all of you. There's a lot of faces in the audience this morning that are very familiar to me, and it's so good to see all of you. And there's a lot of new faces that I have not met, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you better over the course of the next few days. I want to certainly express my appreciation for the invitation to be here with you. Very much appreciate the elders inviting me and giving me this opportunity to study with you and grow with you as we consider some things from the Word of God. Of course, our theme for the next few days is Jesus is coming soon. And this morning, we want to establish that fact. We want to spend some time looking at the details of what that day will be like. Of course, as we're going to see, there's a lot about it that we don't know. Primarily, we don't know when it will be, when that day will finally come. But there are details that we are told. And over the next few days, after we have established some of these truths, my hope and prayer is to study some lessons to the effect of preparing us for that day. Nobody knows when it's going to come, but we can be ready for it. And we're going to see that as we look at various things again over the next few days together. John chapter 5, verse 28. We're going to read this passage to set the tone for our thoughts this morning. Verse 28 there says, Do not marvel at this. Of course, this is Jesus speaking. He says, The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice, and they will come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The title of this morning's lesson is Unexpected Reveille. I don't know how many of you, when you were younger, some of you are still young, and so maybe this pertains to you uh, especially, but many of us probably went to some kind of a summer camp growing up, and I don't know about you, but the camp that I went to in the morning, in the wee hours of the morning, you'd be laying there, and I remember one morning very vividly, I was laying there and just in that state of sleep where you're kind of half awake, half asleep, but you're just so comfortable and you're just looking forward to sleeping in for another hour or two hours or whatever it is. And I remember perceiving these boots coming into the cabin door and I made out this fellow camper had this trumpet in his hands. And I knew what was coming. And within a matter of seconds we heard and we're all, you know, Scared half to death, people were banging their head on the bunk and on top of them and falling out of the beds and unexpected. But nonetheless, got everybody's attention, woke everybody up. You know, a similar thing is going to happen when the final day comes. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 that the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, notice, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I doubt that the tune that is played on that trumpet on that final day will be Reveille, but it will get your attention nonetheless. I guarantee that. We will all be woken up. But the question is, when that trumpet plays... What will be our fate? Will we rejoice as we hear this glorious sound, looking forward to the blessed hope that is laid up for those who are faithful to God through His Son, Jesus Christ? Or will we suddenly have an overwhelming sense of dread as we realize our time is up and we are unprepared to meet our God? The scriptures certainly bear out that that day will come as a thief in the night. And that phrase simply denotes that it's going to be, as we've said, unexpected. Nobody expects the hour in which somebody begins to try and break into your house, for example. 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, if you turn with me here, read just a few verses. And I encourage you all to have your Bibles open. In the past, uh, it was kind of my common practice to put a lot of the scriptures up on the screen for us to read. But I've, over the years, kind of gotten away from that some. And I feel that it's better for everybody if we turn and read these things together. I think it's good practice for us to learn where things are. And it helps you not take my word for anything, because you can see it right before your very eyes, in your very own Bibles. So we'll be turning to the majority of scriptures that we consider this morning and over the next few days. But here in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, we find that Peter, through the Spirit, says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so as we begin to consider what is going to happen on that final day, we certainly see here that the physical creation, that which was spoken into existence by God back in the book of Genesis, it will come to an end. Just as the great flood at one point destroyed the earth, this time it's going to be ultimately consumed, as we read here, by fire. And there will be nothing physical left. Only the spiritual will remain. We find back here in the book of Matthew another important detail as to what will take place at that time. The fact that we will all stand before the king. And we will all give an account of the lives we have led while living here on this earth. Here in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is speaking concerning these things. Beginning there in verse 31, read with me. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. And all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And in verse 34, we read the fate of those who are in the right place, those that have led the right kind of life. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Those are words that we all long to hear. But as we jump down a few verses there to verse 41, we find that a very different thing will be uttered to those who have led a life of rebellion against the Lord. Verse 41 says, He will say to those on His left hand, Depart from Me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I always like to make note there at verse 41 as he's describing this eternal punishment, this lake of fire, as the book of Revelation defines it, you notice who it's prepared for? He doesn't say that it's prepared for the human beings who have rebelled and lived unfaithfully. He says it's prepared for the devil and his angels. God's intention for you is to not go to this place. When God designed you and made you, His intention for you was to be with Him for all eternity. But nevertheless, if we choose, because of our free will, to ignore God's desires, God's wishes for our lives, then when the end comes, we will be cast into a place that was never meant for us. We find another interesting detail as we come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As we consider what will become of our bodies, we understand that we are more than just flesh and bone, that God 
gave us a spirit and a soul that will live forever. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, the latter part of this chapter, it is described what will become of us in eternity. Verse 50, beginning there, it says, Brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all, notice, be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, notice at the last trumpet, that lines up where these things are going to occur, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks, he says, be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore He encourages us, be steadfast, be immovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You go back to the book of Ecclesiastes and you read the words of Solomon there and he talks about how all is vanity, all is striving after the wind. Pursuing riches and pursuing wealth and honor, all those types of things that men, even today, esteem as the most admirable thing that we could be doing. Solomon concludes, it's all empty. It's all meaningless because none of those things last. But did you notice here, our labor for the Lord is not in vain. It means something. It's worth something. And so as we go back, we read earlier there in John chapter 5 that all the dead will be raised and they're all going to be raised incorruptible. The question is, where is that incorruptible body going to dwell for eternity? Is it going to be separated from God or is it going to be with God? The choice is ours. What will you say? As we go back to that scene there in the cabin at summer camp, all kinds of crazy things were uttered when that trumpet blasted and people were falling out of their beds. What will you say when the final trumpet sounds? I have a couple possibilities that we're going to consider here together. I would venture to say that a lot of people are going to say, uh-oh, or some other variation that probably wouldn't be appropriate to utter. <laughs> Will that be our reaction? We see the clouds rolled back. We see Jesus descending. The angels with Him. We hear that trumpet. Things start to dissolve around us. Do we say, uh-oh? We come back here to 2 Peter chapter 3. We were there a moment ago. I'd like us to jump back and read some of the verses preceding those that we read earlier. Start actually in verse 1 of the chapter. But we find that even in the days of the Apostle Peter, it was not uncommon for people to doubt that Jesus was even coming back. Verse 1 here, beginning, it says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This is what they say. Well, things are just going on like they always have. You guys keep saying Jesus is coming back. I see no evidence of that. But verse 5, notice, For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. 
But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Of course, we read concerning that a few verses down in greater detail. But there will be those, when that day finally comes, that are like these individuals here. Jesus isn't coming back. You guys have been preaching that for years and years, and all things are continuing on just like they always have. But they fail to go to the record, as Peter mentions here. They forget that there was a time in the past when God, by the power of His Word, destroyed this world. Not completely, but He flooded the earth and destroyed all life save Noah and his family and the animals that they brought on board, as you recall. How foolish to be of such a mindset today, especially in light of all the evidence that we have, as we considered with our time a little earlier this morning. All the evidence that exists to show us that this is the Word of God, that this is not men's ideas, this is not wisdom so-called of mankind that's been accumulated over the years. This is the revelation of God. Come here with me to 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. And starting here in verse 7, again, the Apostle Paul writing, he says, To give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. He says, In flaming fire He will take vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a point that we'll be coming back to before we conclude. But those that don't know God, those that don't render obedience to the gospel of God, he says they are going to suffer this destruction. Verse 9, continuing, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power when He comes in that day, to be glorified in His saints, to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Again, which group will we fall into? We made reference a few moments ago to the fact that so many today, their highest priority is to get promoted at work, to make more money, have a bigger house, have more cars, have more possessions, more things that they can pile up in the backyard and point to and say, look how much better I'm doing than you. Look how much stuff I have for myself. All the while forgetting that those things don't last. You know, Jesus taught a parable to this effect here in Luke chapter 12. I like us to read it together, beginning in verse 13 there to set the context. It says, One from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And so he said, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said, Take heed, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, I'll build greater, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods. I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, be merry. But notice, God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And here's the key, verse 21. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Let us recognize this morning that if we want to be able to rejoice when that last trumpet sounds, our confidence cannot be in earthly things. Our confidence must be in the Lord. Perhaps you will say, could you come back tomorrow? You know, sometimes in life, somebody calls us or stops by to visit, and we say, eh, now's not really a good time. I got some things maybe to prepare before you come in or before I sit down and have a conversation with you, so call me back. 
Uh, this will be a better time for me. You see, we don't have that liberty when it comes to the end of time. We can't just, upon seeing Christ coming, say, well, can I have just, you know, maybe another couple hours? i got a couple things I need to attend to, and then I'll be ready to go. And we can't do that. We have to be ready when the events begin to unfold, which means we have to start now, doesn't it? Come over here to the book of Acts. We read about an individual here who put off what he knew needed to be done. Acts chapter 24 and verse 24. We find that after some days, Felix came with his, with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as Paul reasoned about righteousness, about self-control, about the judgment to come, notice Felix was afraid. We might liken it to the reaction that those Jews had on the day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2 where they were cut to their heart. Of course, in their situation, it was, men, brethren, what shall we do? But Felix, he's determined to, well, I don't want to think about this right now. I don't want to deal with these things right now. I'll deal with them later when it's more convenient. Notice what he says there. He says, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Now, as far as we know, that convenient time for Felix never came. We don't have a record of it. But that certainly was the mindset that we read of here, and one that we cannot emulate if we want to have hope of heaven. Come with me back here to the book of James for a moment. James chapter 4, a passage I'm sure is familiar to some of us. Beginning here in verse 13, we understand that Really, there's two ways that our time can expire. It's either going to be Jesus coming back, as we've been talking about, or as James is talking about here, it could just be the fact that we grow old and the end of our lives here comes to an end. We die physically. He says, Come now, verse 13, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, we'll spend a year there buying and selling, we'll make a profit. He says, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? He says, it's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, I've talked with a number of you already, kind of reminiscing and talking about, well, has it really been two years? And Last night we were over at Rebecca and Dwayne's house and the Hardens arrived and I came out to say hello to them and Jason's standing there talking to this woman, had her back to me, and I was like, who in the world is that? I don't recognize her. She turns around, and it's Chloe. And I'm like, you grew about twice your height since I last saw you, and I've gotten similar comments for my children. But we recognize, don't we, just how fast life flies by. Now, I'm just about 30 years old, and I'm already rapidly understanding that. It seems like every year that goes by, goes by just slightly faster than the year before it did. Our life is but a vapor. What does he go on to say, though, in light of these things? Verse 15, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you're boasting in your arrogance. He says such boasting is evil. And so verse 17, this is really the key passage or verse here that I want us to, to hone in on. He says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, notice the result, to him it is sin. Sin separates us from God, Romans 6 verse 23. And so this morning perhaps you are here and you are outside the body of Christ. You've never been baptized for the remission of your sins. You understand the Bible teaches that you need to do those things. What's the admonition that we are to gather from verses such as this? Don't put it off. Don't say, well, when it's more convenient, next year or next month, or when I'm this age or that age, because we don't know when the end will come. And we don't want to be found unprepared. My prayer is that all of us here this morning, 
in thinking about these events that we're discussing, the second coming of Jesus Christ, that we'll be able to say, Alleluia. Praise the Lord when we see Him coming in the clouds, when we hear that trumpet sound. You come with me back here to the book of Revelation chapter 19. Read just a few verses here in this chapter. Verse 6 beginning says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad, notice that, and rejoice and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. Of course, we understand that to be the church and Christ, the marriage, the union that is to come when He returns. Verse 8, To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Obedience that we render to God. A few pages back, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, the last chapter of the Bible, the next to last verse, verse 20. Notice it says, He who testifies to these things says, this is Christ speaking, Surely I am coming quickly. And what is the reaction of the apostle in light of that information? What does he say? He says, Amen. That word means, so be it. Amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Can we say that this morning and mean it? Jesus is coming soon, and He's coming quickly. Amen. Come quickly, Jesus. We are looking forward. Did you notice the language we read there in 2 Peter 3 earlier? We were talking about there, beginning in verse 10, how all things are going to be dissolved. Notice that Peter said that we're looking forward to those things. When you look forward to something, it's something positive. It's something that you're eager to experience, whether it's a birthday or promotion at work, whatever it might be. Do we look forward to the end of time? You see, in Christ, it's not a scary thing. It's a blessed thing. It's a blessed event that we are looking forward to. Being free of this world that is filled with, with pain and despair, troubles, worries, anxieties, all that will be gone. But is that our attitude? Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, come with me here. First Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll read the first 11 verses here. And it is made plain here for us that, again, this day does not have to be something that we dread, but rather something that we can look forward to and should look forward to. Verse 1, But concerning the times, the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, as we've read in other places, for when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. He says, you're all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night, but let us who are of the day again be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Again, we notice there in Matthew 25, hell is not prepared for mankind. We're not appointed to wrath. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. The Lord Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. And notice, therefore, comfort each other, edify one another, just as you also are doing. Finally, we'll visit 2 Peter 3 just one more time before we close. 
And notice verse 14. He says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward... See the language? Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless. The only way we can stand before God in a condition such as we just read is through the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood is the only thing that can wash away our sins. And so are we ready? Will we utter hallelujah when the end of time finally comes? When that unexpected trumpet finally sounds? We'll conclude here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Again, the writer of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John, he says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, just as he went. Go to Acts chapter 1 there, verse 9 through 11. We see that when he left and went back to the Father, he went up and the cloud received him out of their sight. And they stood there gazing into heaven and the two in the white robes appeared. They said, why are you gazing into heaven? He'll return just the same way that he went up. And John confirms that very thing. He is coming with clouds. And notice, every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. But again, notice the attitude of the one writing, even so, amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I certainly pray that if you're here this morning and you are in a condition, you recognize that you are separated from God because we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 makes that so very plain to us. We've all broken and gone against the commandments of God. That's, that's what sin is. It's a transgression of the law. 1 John 3, verse 4. We're all guilty of it, but there's a remedy. The gift of God, Romans 6, 23, the latter part of that verse, is eternal life through, again, His Son, Jesus Christ. Come with me here to Acts chapter 2. We made reference there a few moments ago. And we talked about how those on that day as Peter was preaching to them concerning the fact that you are guilty before God. I mean, these individuals were the ones who actually shouted crucify Him and put Jesus Christ on the cross. When they heard this, verse 37, they were cut to their heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How can we make ourselves right? Verse 38, Peter says, repent let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 40 there, it says, With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. You know, there's some that teach today that there's nothing we have to do to receive salvation that God just grants it to us because He loves us so much. Well, He certainly does love us. He certainly made it available, but there's something that we have to do. Not that we're meriting salvation, not that we're by our works earning the right to go to heaven, but no, it's an answer of a good conscience towards God, as the Apostle wrote. When we die with Christ, we repent of our sins, put the old man to death, we're buried in the watery grave of baptism, so that we can rise as Jesus rose in a newness of life, as a new creation, having been born again. We are put into Christ. We are added to the church. Verse 47 of the chapter. And we can look forward with confidence, with eagerness to the end of time. Whether it's my life has expired or Jesus is coming. Are you ready this morning? If you're here and you need to make some correction, we stand ready to assist you. We're about to sing this song, number 320. Will, will Jesus find us watching? Are we prepared? If you're unprepared this morning and you need to make your life right, we would just simply ask that you would make that known, come up to the front, and we would happily assist you in whatever way that you need assisted regarding your obedience to the Son of God. Why don't you do that now as we come and sing this song?